Today's program is agriculture in the Connecticut River Valley, its ups and downs through the centuries. Our presenter is Steve Taylor. He comes to us today from Meriden Village in New Hampshire, where with his sons, he operates a dairy, cheese making, and maple syrup enterprise. He graduated from the University of New Hampshire with a political science major. He became a reporter and was the managing editor for the Valley News. But then he decided he wanted to be more involved with his rural roots. He served as New Hampshire's Agricultural Commission for 25 years, retiring in 2007. He has served in his town as a select board member. He's the founding director of New Hampshire's Humanities Council and travels to groups such as ours sharing his love of all things rural. Today, he will give us a look back through the Connecticut River Valley's agricultural history from the pioneering settlers in the 1760s to today, discussing the changes in the land and the farming over the centuries. Please welcome Steve Taylor. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to come to Springfield today. Happy to be here. As you heard, I'm from Meriden Village. And where the heck is Meriden Village? Well, it's a village in the town of Plainfield. And I always ask you, have you ever heard of Plainfield, New Hampshire? Show of hand, please. Yeah. Ah, yes, you got some problems there. I was over in uh, Carroll County one night, and uh, there was a group about like this. And I said, have anybody ever heard of Plainfield, New Hampshire? And his one hand went up. And he was from Parsons Field, Maine. So, so Plainfield is not well. If you don't know where it is, it's, it's Charlestown, Claremont, Cornish, Plainfield, Lebanon, Hanover. So we're right up there. We're a... Uh, uh, we have a strong, strong history of agriculture in Plainfield, but, uh, and we still have pretty strong agriculture, but we're a bedroom town for Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Uh, we have uh, over a hundred physicians that live in the town, and then hundreds of other people, that, uh, the nurses and the technology people and the people that try to send out those terrible bills that you get. Uh, anyway, uh, so it's a good town to live in, and I, I've always lived there all my life. Uh, how did I get into agriculture? You heard I, I was a political science major and then I was a newspaper guy and done a lot of different things. Uh, my father was a longtime teacher at Windsor High School. And we grew up in Plainfield, my, my boys and I, uh, my brother and sister and I, and, and uh, uh, I wanted my boys to have the same experience I had uh, growing up, because my father was a teacher, but he was also a farmer. And uh, I wanted my kids to have that experience. And so my late wife used to say, it started off as a 4-H project, but it went haywire, because <laughs> we started out, we had two calves and 10 sheep, and it morphed over the years into a dairy farm. We milked anywhere between 50 and 60 cows, and we have this cheese plant that we developed in the last few years, and it's very successful, actually. And then we're in the maple business, and uh, that's, uh, uh, anything disrupts life, it's maple. Oh, my God. And now I gotta be, everybody's got to be in the woods, and everybody disappears, and they leave me all these lousy jobs, cleaning out pens and all that stuff. And they, well, we're working in the woods today. Well, what do you do? And, oh, we had a lot of things to do. Blah, 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 blah. But, I don't know. And then when they start boiling, they're out there all night, and it just goes on and on. Anyway, I, uh, I, I love talking about the agricultural history of the Connecticut Valley. Now, somebody said, well, you're going to talk about what the Indians did. I don't know what the Indians did. I really don't know. I'm just not up to speed on it. And you can probably find a lecturer who will give you a heck of a talk. But I get enough information about the Indian times to be con totally confused, because there are some who say that the Indians in this region, the Abenaki, they were not agrarian at all. They were hunters and gatherers, and they fished the river and all of that, lived on salmon and, and all of that. And others say, oh, well, they had all kinds of cornfields, and they grew squash and all that. I don't know, and I, I don't want to go there. I don't know anything about it. But I want to start with the European settlers who came up the river uh, to settle this country. And uh, that's the 1750s and the 1760s. The fort number four was the outpost of, uh, of the northern reach in the 1750s. And uh, we had uh, 
uh, with the granting of townships by old Benning Wentworth over in Portsmouth, that kicked off agriculture in this region. And here's why. Because uh, Benny Wentworth had the power from the king to uh, carve up uh, all this land that they didn't know what was out there. They had no idea. Beyond the Merrimack River, there was just total wilderness. And uh, there had been some exploration by Rogers, Rangers, and some others uh, during the French and Indian War. But uh, Wentworth said, we'll just grid it off in six mile square lots. And uh, we'll see if we can get somebody to go there and settle that country. And uh, he was basically, uh, he was on the take. Uh, if he could make some money, he would uh, he'd pull off a deal with anybody. And so what would happen with these, uh, these they call them proprietors from Connecticut, in this instance, around here, and they'd go up to, uh, to Portsmouth and say, hey, give us a township and, and we'll move it ahead. And Wentworth would say, okay, but here's what you have to do. You have to establish a town government within five years, and you've got somebody to stay there year-round, settle, pioneer the land, and, and get a uh, uh, settlement going. And so that's a pretty tall challenge. And some of these towns, they, they didn't really get going until the 1770s, because couldn't find anybody willing to take the chance and do it. But, uh, but that's how these towns got going, really, and that's how agriculture got started. People came up from Connecticut. And that's why most of these towns around here have Connecticut names. You know, Weathersfield, Plainfield, Anfield, Canaan, Norwich, Pomfret, Woodstock, all these towns have Connecticut names because these were Connecticut settlers who came up here and they came to farm to try to get uh, agriculture established. And there was tremendous pressure in Connecticut because in Connecticut, during the 1700s, they had the highest fertility rates human fertility rates ever experienced in the continental United States. They bred like rabbits, literally, and they had tremendous population pressure. So you got 10 kids, and we got to get land, we got to move and, and, and expand out. It's the same problem the Amish are having in Pennsylvania now. You realize there's more Amish in, in Ohio than there are in Pennsylvania because they, they keep breeding and they, they need land to farm and they want to farm. Well, anyway, here come these settlers. They're coming up the river by hook and by crook. They find, they get a, a chunk of land. They've granted 100 acres by these proprietors back home in Connecticut. And they, they say, go to it. If you can farm, you're, you're on your own. And so imagine the challenges that these people faced. And the number one challenge was the forest, the vast forest gigantic trees. How are you going to get crops growing if the land is covered with these enormous trees? But what they set out to do was clear the land. And they set out to do it in a most brutal fashion. Much of the land was cleared with fire. The good pine along the rivers, those trees went to be masts, decent pine for saw timber. But the hardwood forest, about 65% of the land cover of this region, was hardwood. Beach was 35% of the hardwood cover. How the heck are you going to farm if you got a six foot beech tree in the way? Well, they had a very simple procedure. It's called stubbing. They take a hatchet, girdle that tree, kill that tree. The second year there'd be no leaves on that tree. Sun could shine down through and hit the forest floor. They could scratch around in the dirt and begin to raise oats, barley, wheat, get production of food going. After four or five years, a gigantic tree would have dried out enough so they could set fire to it. They'd build a fire around the base and burn as much of that tree as they could. But they never could burn it all down. They'd end up with a stub, 10, 15 foot hideous black charred stub, four or five feet thick. After 10 to 12 years, the roots would have rotted on that thing enough so they could pull it over with the oxen, get it out of the way and end up with what today we call a meadow, a field, a pasture. We have no conception of what it took to accomplish the clearing of the land, such that by 1810, 80% of the land area of New Hampshire south of the White Mountains was cleared, and almost as much uh, uh, as, as in Vermont. Uh, incredible undertaking. Again, we have no conception. After a while, they began to realize the byproduct of all this fire had value, ashes. 
and they began to gather up ashes, and that became the first cash crop of agriculture in Vermont and western New Hampshire. Those ashes contained potassium. Potassium, a central element for production of glass and gunpowder uh, powder and a whole bunch of other industrial products. And so they began to gather up the ashes as they burned out all this wood, and that was a cash crop. They could put it in barrels, a lot of it went back to Europe. And so that's how it was. Well, it was subsistence agriculture. Agriculture to feed themselves. That was the primary purpose of all of this activity. And then at this point, I have to emphasize the importance of the cow. I will submit that a lot of this settlement couldn't have succeeded without the cow. The cow is an amazing machine. Look what the cow can do. She produces milk, and that milk can produce fat, essential for the human diet. Fat can be preserved in the form of butter with a lot of salt in it. Uh, produces protein, protein for the human diet. Can be preserved with a lot of salt as cheese. The cow produces leather, an essential commodity for all kinds of uh, 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 necessary goods. The cow produces offspring. If it's female, she's raised to join the herd. If it's male, it's castrated, it becomes an ox. And oxen were the primary means of motive power for agriculture, for forestry, for transport in this region until the early 20th century. Everybody said, oh boy, horses. Yeah, horses are around, but here's the problem with horses. Horses are, they tend to work too fast, and people don't like them. They're good for, for hooking up to the buggy, and eh, pull some heavy loads. But the basic problem with the horse, for these people, was this. They don't eat horse meat. Well, if you want to eat horse meat, you go to Belgium today. You don't, we don't eat horse meat. And so an ox, when it comes to the end of the line, you can slaughter it, and you've got beef. But a horse comes to the end of the line, we're not going to eat the horse, all right? <laughs> anyway, so this subsistence agriculture, it, it gets going. By the time of the American Revolution, well established. These communities along the river particularly, uh, a viable agricultural economy develops. And it's, it gets to the point where uh, there's enough surplus that it can be put into the sort of the cash economy, the, the market economy. And so as early as uh, 1780, this area produced hogs, turkeys, uh, beef that could be driven over the road to the Boston market. And it produced grain. And actually Vermont was a, was a breadbasket uh, up to 1820, 1830 of, uh, of New England before the rail and the transportation to the Midwest opened up this region to Midwestern grains. So here, here is agriculture uh, expanding, growing, but it's subsistence to feed the local population, the primary focus being. Well, that gets me to 1809. And this is the absolute most important year in the history of agriculture in this region. William Jarvis is Thomas Jefferson's ambassador to the Spanish court. William Jarvis is a very successful Boston businessman. He had to have been politically connected, had to have been a friend or at least an acquaintance of Thomas Jefferson. But he also owned a farm, Weathersfield Bow, Vermont. Mr. Jarvis is posted to Lisbon. He arrives there and he's accepted by the Spanish court. His credentials are in order. One of the first things he does is go out in the countryside and take a look around. And there he sees vast flocks of incredible sheep. Sheep unlike anything back home. Sheep with fleeces that his wool is this deep. Incredible numbers of sheep, millions of these animals. To that point, European nobility and royalty had basically embargoed good breeding stock from being moved to the New World because they feared competition. But at this point, the Spanish court was facing the imminent threat of Napoleon's hordes invading the Iberian Peninsula. So they needed to raise money to wage war. They were, Mr. Jarvis and an Englishman put together a deal. Obviously, they didn't have any ethics laws in those days. You could be an agent of the United States government and do some business on the side. And so they put together a deal to obtain 15,000 of these incredible sheep. Now, there were several breeds represented, but today we kind of use an umbrella term, merino, for these, these sheep. 
7,500 of these sheep in the first wave, Jarvis arranged to have sent to New England. And the other 7,500 went to the British Isles. Mr. Jarvis reserved 300 of the best for himself, and they were landed at Newburyport. And imagine 300 sheep driven overland to Wethersfield, Vermont, distance of 110 miles. They did it. They got it done. And then that set off a, a, a way. Others got in on this deal. Everybody was kind of interested, and so there was a market. And people started putting together deals in a period of probably about 18 months to two years to move a lot of sheep over here, probably 30 or 40,000 head. Imagine moving sheep on a rickety old sailing vessel from Spain to New England. Uh, you got to bring a lot of water, you got to have feed for them, you've got to have something to tend them. I mean, that's an incredible undertaking in itself. Well, anyway, as these sheep begin to arrive, they become the basis of an incredible bubble. Not unlike the high tech bubble or the dot com bubble or the real estate bubble or any of these other bubbles we know about in our lives. This was a bubble of its own. People wanted to get their hands on some of these genetics that these sheep represented. And they wanted to get a ram to breed with the motley, low-grade sheep that we had here. They wanted to get three or four ewes to breed to get multipliers going, to build up numbers. And it was an incredible uh, uh, wave. They call it the merino craze or a whole bunch of things. I just call it the sheep boom. But in a matter of five or six years, we had explosive growth in numbers of sheep. And in a decade's time, incredible growth in numbers of sheep on the land in this area right here. My little town, Plainfield, 1815 had 1,100 sheep. By 1824, I had 10,000. I mean, think of that, just the explosive growth and what was happening uh, all over this region. Um, everybody wanted to get in. And as that was developing, of course, it began to attract capital. Up to that point, manufacture of wool and textiles was a cottage industry. You've heard the term, homespun. Well, that's how uh, garments and blankets and things got made, done in the home. Uh, with uh, this resource of wool suddenly becoming available, attracted capital. You go up to Claremont, go in the mill district, down by the common man. The oldest building there, the cornerstone, 1816. Wherever you had waterfalls, you built mills, mills, mills to process this wool. And uh, uh, again, incredible wealth was being created by all of this. Well, they had some problems with all these sheep. Explosive growth. First big challenge was confinement. How does Willis Wood keep his sheep separate from mine, all right? Or Ned Coffin's sheep get mixed up with Willis's. What do we got to do? Well, we'll cut down all the trees, we ain't got any wood, and steel wire hasn't been invented yet. What do we got? How are we going to build walls? Well, come on, people. Rocks, all right? We got lots of rocks, okay? We went on an incredible 50-year span of time. 250,000 miles of stone walls were built in the New England states. And they built them around here, everywhere, stone walls. Any place you go, in Springfield or Walpole or any place around here, and you walk through the forest and there's a stone wall, that land was cleared, there were sheep there. Those stone walls were built to keep them up, mostly four feet high. Keep a sheep in, won't keep a cow in. That's what moved that. You can read these books. I can't believe. And they say, oh, they built stone walls for the hell of that. No, that did not happen. <laughs> so anyways, confinement, number one problem. Number two problem, predators. This is a natural habitat of the eastern timber wolf. Now, they chopped down most of the trees with the cover for the wolf, but the wolf per persisted. And so the wolf kills for the hell of it. And uh, that was a major threat. So it became imperative to stamp out the wolf population. And they did a pretty damn good job of it. It was the kind of thing where if a wolf was spotted, everything was dropped until they hunted it down and killed it. Now you go over to Keene, and they have a wonderful historical society exhibit there. And one of the drawings 
it shows these uh, farmers up on the top of Mount Monadnock, and they set it all ablaze up there, and the wolves are coming out, and they've got the pictures of guys drawing beads on those, on those wolves coming out of the flames, all right? So there you say, that's why the top of Monadnock has no trees. Ah, I don't believe that, but anyway. Uh, so getting rid of the wolf, that was a big challenge. Number three, that terrible time, parasites. Anytime you take ruminant animals and you build up the numbers, you got problems, parasites. And uh, most commonly, most the biggest problem, we call it stomach worms. They're just uh, nematodes that live in the gut of the sheep. They don't kill the sheep, but they debilitate the sheep because they suck the blood through the intestinal wall, make the sheep weak and prone to other kinds of afflictions like pneumonia or whatever. Uh, so they had to go all out, figure out a way to try to c at least control uh, the parasites, uh, these intestinal parasites. Uh, they, they had too many sheep to really practice rotational grazing the way we would today, uh, but the, the worm cycle in sheep, very simple. The adults shell, uh, shed eggs, passes out in the dung, uh, the eggs attach to the underside of the grass, sheep comes along, eats the grass, and here we go again, it repeats the cycle. They tried all kinds of means to try to deal with it. And the one I like the best is they take a commonly grown plant that people grew, and a lot of it was grown right around here. They take that plant and they press it. And they get the juice. And they take that juice and they make a tea. Force some of that tea down the sheep's gullet to kill the worms. What do you suppose that plant was? Tobacco. Well, I tell, I tell high school kids when I give this talk, I would say, if you still chew tobacco or you smoke, those chemicals in that tobacco can kill worms in a sheep's stomach. Think what it can do to you. <laughs> right. Anyway, and um, then they had problems with foot rot. Foot rot's just a pathogen gets in the cleft of the hoof here and causes inflammation. Doesn't kill the sheep, but makes the sheep weak and debilitated and prone to other kinds of afflictions. And so um, they used, again, they used tobacco juice on that and, and other uh, dreadful things. And then ticks. And there's some evidence that the tick that most bothers sheep, sheep uh, the tick does the same thing on the outside of the sheep as the worm does inside. That uh, this, the ticks that most commonly afflict sheep today probably came on some of those sheep that Jarvis and his successors uh, brought over here. Uh, uh, in Plainfield, uh, they'd shear the sheep in June, and uh, they'd take a dam up, blow me down brook, and they'd dump a bunch of arsenic in it, and run those sheep through that to dip the sheep, get poison, and kill the ticks. Because obviously, didn't have any EPA in those days, and they worry about that. And, uh, and the, but the biggest problem was malnutrition. The feed they had to feed was lousy. Um, they always cut hay, they, they, the, the tradition was to cut hay on the start on the first Monday after the 4th of July. Well, we know today that that's a, a pretty poor way of making good feed for livestock. I mean, you go over here and anywhere along the river here and you see these big dairy farms, they're all done cutting hay the first crop by Memorial Day because that feed is so valuable. It's the nutrient dense, top quality feed. Well, these people were putting up poor quality hay, and they didn't cut all the hay on the first day that they began. They cut hay all summer long. And uh, so those sheep had to live through the winter on pretty poor rations. And so they had terrible mortality. Not only mortality, but it also depressed their lamb crop. In other words, the fertility. Uh, today, good sheep farmer will say, I want a 200% lamb crop. That means a ewe is exposed to ram. In five months' time, she had two babies, all right? In those days, they had 85% lamb crop. They thought they were doing well. In other words, some of the sheep would die during the winter, or they were in a poor nutritional level at the time of breeding, and they didn't conceive, or they aborted, all of these things. And so uh, the feed was critical. It was, it was a terrible problem. Well, anyway, we have this uh, industry, and uh, just to give you a flavor of the extent of this sheep industry in this area, I'm going to give you some numbers. This was the, the peak here. The, peak year of sheep numbers in these towns right around here, 1834, was Springfield. These are animals over one year of age, 
17,872 sheep in Springfield, Vermont. Mm -hmm. Wethersfield, 14,407 head. Rockingham, 12,601. Westminster, 13,766. Walpole, 14,875. If we just took any four of those towns and added them up, it'd be way over 50,000 which is more sheep than are in all of New England today. I mean, that is an incredible industry. My town, Cornish, Plainfield, Lebanon, Hanover, Lyme and Offer, those six towns had enough sheep to way over 50,000. Hanover had 12,000 sheep. I'll tell you, if I showed up with a truck with 100 sheep in the back of it at the Hanover town line, I'd be met by four cruisers, at least. <laughs> anyway, so we had this great boom going on, and the, and, the, and the rise of the woolen industry, the textile culture of New England, began with this wool boom. Uh, you go to Manchester and you see the vast Amoskeag complex along the Merrimack River. That was cotton mills. That came later, that came later. It was a different, a different uh, focus. Um, and many of the other big, really big mill operations, they were cotton mills. Um, so anyway, this, this the whole thing goes along merrily and um, we have an uh, incredible uh, boom of fortunes being made. And then there's a watershed year, 1837. A bunch of forces come together and pop the bubble. The boom ends abruptly. And what were those forces? Number one was the opening of the Erie Canal and railroads to the Midwest. And so competition for production of wool began to uh, affect. The mill owners could get wool cheaper, buying it from somebody in Ohio and having it shipped by rail out here. Um, number two was the depression that set in, an economic panic that set in in 1837. Andrew Jackson had abolished the equivalent of the Federal Reserve, and so it became state banks which were issuing currency. And there was a New Hampshire state bank and a Vermont state bank. And you uh, had the problem of these crooks in Quebec who counterfeited a lot of the state bank notes. So you went up to uh, White River Junction to buy some supplies with $100 of state bank currency. They discounted 20, 30% because it could be bogus. And so that was happening. And then the Industrial Revolution was setting in in earnest. And with the Industrial Revolution, people working indoors, they didn't need heavy woolen garments so much. The box stove and central heat were being perfected. People didn't need heavy woolen blankets so much. And so that was beginning to depress the value of this wool crop that they were producing. Those forces were coming together. And then on top of all that was the simple exhaustion of the soils from too many sheep. And so as early as 1840 began the abandonment of agriculture, particularly above 1,500 feet of elevation. And there's a marvelous study done by a professor at Plymouth State where she tracks the town of Sandwich, New Hampshire by decade and the contraction of farming activity as land is abandoned, what we say going back to the Indians, the forest volunteers and takes over. That land cleared at enormous toil reverting to forest. Incredible the way that happened and it happened so fast. The book was written in 1925 by a professor at Dartmouth College, James Goldthwaite. His book was called, the booklet really, The Town That Went Downhill. It's about Lyme, New Hampshire, where he tracks, and this is 1925, he tracks the contraction of agricultural activity in the reversion of the land in Lyme to forest to the point where now uh, the agriculture is on the Connecticut River and there are two villages and the rest of the town is, is wealthy people's mansions. It's uh, incredible that change. Um, so anyway, what's the legacy of that great time? Well, it's pretty obvious. The two uh, visible, tangible legacies we see on the land are the stone walls. I already talked about the stone walls and how extensive they were, but they were an incredible feat, really. It's just incredible what was accomplished with those stone walls. And uh, uh, they said that uh, 
two men with a team of oxen, a stone boat, an iron bar, and a length of chain should be able to build one rod's worth of stone wall four feet high in a day. That's 16 and a half feet. Uh, anybody want to go out with me tomorrow, we'll give it a shot. We will not do it, I can guarantee. So it's an incredible, incredible undertaking. We're down now under 100,000 miles of stone walls, they estimate, left. Uh, an awful lot of them, of course, were used in the 1920s and 1930s, the perfection of the bulldozer. They pull the material of roadside stone walls in, make good base to build an improved road. And uh, in the 50s and 60s, you could go to the county uh, uh, federal office and they'd give you a check and you could hire somebody to come with a bulldozer and dig a great big hole and pull all the stone wall material in and cover it over. And they called it obstruction removal to facilitate modern farm activity. Ooh, a lot of people took advantage of that. That took care of a lot of stone walls. And then of course now we're continuing to gather them up and use them for what I call landscape uh, purposes. Uh, my late wife and I went to Nantucket one time, about 10 years ago, and we got on the ferry there just to go out and take a look around. It was in April. There were three great big 10-wheelers uh, with main plates on them, and they were loaded with stone wall rock because uh, they don't have any stones out on Nantucket to build. And uh, I figured, uh, I, I bet Mr. Madoff got some of those stones. You know? <laughs> So anyway, that, that was it. That, the stone walls are an incredible undertaking, and uh, uh, there's a wonderful lecturer in New Hampshire. He goes around. And he's a he's a dry stone mason, and he he does a fabulous lecture about it. And he can walk through the woods. And he can say that wall right there was built by Scotsmen. This wall was built by Italians. That wall over there was built by local farmers. Tell by the way the stones are laid up. Does it. And while this guy's doing this lecture, he's got a five-gallon bucket of pebbles, and he's building a stone wall on the table right in front of him, and he never misses a beat. When he's all done, has this cute little stone wall about that high and that long. <laughs> I didn't talk. Anyway, okay, the other the tangible thing is the architecture, the lovely architecture and of the Connecticut Valley especially, the, the beautiful buildings that endure today. And people ride around and say, oh, look at that pretty colonial house. I guarantee you there was no house in colonial times that looked like that. That house was, it may have been started in that time, but it was added onto, it was embellished, or it was built new in the 1820s and 1830s when people had money to spend on nice buildings, public buildings, lovely churches all around this, this region. Uh, Weathersfield Center, that church up there. Uh, go to Heartland, Plainfield, and Cornish. There's five brick churches. They're like sisters. They're almost identical. All built with native brick from a brickyard in Plainfield. All built between 1832 and 1837. And those buildings are durable, beautiful. You know, we don't build buildings like that today. They, they were just so wonderful. Built with sheet money. Okay, so there's a third legacy of that time, and that gets me to the, um, really the second half of my talk, and that is this. It's a social, cultural uh, uh, thing. After this period of great prosperity, there was nothing to take its place. So we moved to about this period of the Civil War, which was a great disruptor of all kinds of things, but post-Civil War, we began to hemorrhage population out of rural New Hampshire, rural Vermont. People packed up and left in droves, in hordes. People went to farm in the Midwest or in Oregon or California. People left to work in the great mills of the Merrimack Valley. We just, we hemorrhaged population. You look at the numbers for Ackworth, New Hampshire. At 1860, had almost 1,800 people. By 1920, it was down to about 400. A lot of towns lost 50, 60% of their population in a period of 50 years. My town, from 1860 to 1890, lost 30% of its population, 40% of its tax base. Because nobody wanted to buy these derelict farms. People had given up and gone. The towns were stuck with these inventories of, of derelict farms. The Board of Agriculture in New Hampshire in the 1880s and 1890s published lists of farms that could be bought for cheap money. 200 acres, house, barn, sheds, 450 bucks. 75 acres with shed, $110. People would buy that. And they circulate that list in Boston and New York. And that was the beginning of summer people. Summer people, <laughs> uh, absolutely. 
And once in a while I run into somebody who says, oh, that's interesting because my great, great grandfather bought our place for $300 in 1896. We wouldn't take 600,000 for it today. <coughs> you know I mean, that, that was what was happening. Governor Frank Rollins in New Hampshire, 1898, he said, I got an idea to get people to come back. In late July, early August, the weather is lovely around here. We'll get people to come back, we'll have food and, and entertainment, get people to recite poetry, do music, do these kinds of things. They'll see how great it is here, and they'll come back and repopulate the countryside. That's the beginning of Old Home Week, Old Home Days, Old Home Sunday. That started in Concord, New Hampshire, and spread to Maine, Vermont, Massachusetts. We still do it today, but it did not repopulate rural New England. If you had railroad or you had mills, you didn't suffer the terrible population losses. But the little hill towns really, really uh, went downhill during that period. So the agriculture that succeeded uh, became primarily uh, served or brought about by the coming of the railroad. The railroad enabled the movement of milk or dairy products to urban markets. The railroad enabled a grower of strawberries in Bradford, Vermont or whatever to put berries on the train and send them to the Boston market or the New York market. The railroad was so important in all of that. First railroad reached southern New Hampshire, 1845. 1846, H.P. Hood was formed and established and then became the biggest dairy company in New England and was a very, it's, the brand is still around today. But it was all because of the railroad. And as the railroads crept north uh, into this area, it wasn't a fluid milk market in those days. It was milk that was processed locally at what we call creameries, manufacture of butter and cheese, which was then shipped by rail to urban markets. And that was the model uh, for the next hundred years, really, the uh, coming of the tractor trailer and the, uh, the interstate highway post-World War II, well, post, well, in the 1960s, really. Uh, the, it's the same model. You pick up milk and you take it a great distance uh, uh, by transport rather than uh, having a whole bunch of dairy farms outside of Boston or Worcester or wherever. The farms are here and they move it by transport. So anyway, uh, that, uh, that period from Civil War to World War II, characterized by loss of population, uh, <laughs> consolidation of agriculture, farms begin to get bigger. But the most important thing is the coming of the application of science and technology to agriculture. Uh, all kinds of things were happening. Perfection of the mowing machine. Up to the perfection of the mowing machine, all the hay around here was cut with scythes. Every single man and boy over 10 years of age was proficient with the scythe. He knew how to sharpen the scythe and how to swing the scythe to cut the hay, to put it in the barn. Mowing machine replaced 20, 30 men and boys. And I, I have to emphasize how much of the labor was soaked up by this enterprise producing hay. It was incredible, everybody. And 10-year-old boys, you learned how to swing the sign. And they had no soccer camps, <laughs> no Xbox, no Twitter, none of that stuff. It worked. Man, did they work, I'll tell you. Um, the technology, all kinds, on every front. It was, it was incredible. I have 1880s. Uh, began to understand microbiology. And maybe we keep the milk cold, it won't go sour. And so along comes commercial refrigeration, the cream separator. Up to that point, they used to do something called set milk. They were great big pans, they pour warm milk in in the morning. One o'clock in the afternoon, go out and you skim off cream. Then you let it set overnight, then you go out and skim off the rest of the cream, and you send the skim milk back to feed the pigs or the calves or whatever. That was the way it was done. With the cream separated, you got a machine, pour the milk in the top, turn a crank, cream comes out over here, skim milk comes out over here. Revolutionized uh, dairying. The understanding about the commercial uh, of, of uh, chilling milk, refrigeration, uh, 18, uh, 1905 or so comes the milking machine. 
didn't need 15, 20 men to milk 30 cows. You can do it with a couple of machines. One or two men can do it. Uh, the coming of, of, uh, of electricity has a profound effect. And then mechanization through the tractor, post-World War I. And that would have a profound impact on the landscape. Because you take a tractor, replaces two or three teams of horses. And those teams of horses are gone. You don't need all that land to produce hay to feed them. Again, more land reverts to forest, goes back to the Indians. And it has a profound psychological effect on people who live in rural areas. It does to me. In my town, there are places where I baled hay in the 1970s that now have trees 30 feet high. It bothers me. I mean, it, 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 it's a profound impact. Imagine somebody in the 1870s, a man 60 years old, could have touched the hand that cleared the land on the hillside to see it revert to forest. So we had this long period, a century, of real melancholy on the land. Melancholy in rural New Hampshire, rural Vermont, uh, and it's, um, it, it, was, it, was, it was profound. That was the rise of the grains. Why the grain stock? It was in response to this period of melancholy. There was something to do. No TV, no movies, no radio. Might see a newspaper once in two weeks. But here comes the grains, it's a social activity every other week, get together, have a meeting, play cards, have some refreshments, see your neighbor. So it brought the grange up to a point where it became a very important institution until the coming, of course, of television and a whole bunch of other things. But anyway, uh, so I'm, I'm getting low on time, but I want to, uh, I, I think I'll leapfrog right over to, uh, to where we are today. I submit to you right now, in this region, our agriculture is moving in two distinctly different tracks. First track is bulk commodity agriculture. People like me who love to milk cows and we produce milk and we hope somebody will buy it. All right? And this cohort has been shrinking. It's been shrinking now for going on 150 years fewer and fewer, the remaining enterprises getting bigger and bigger, right? Within a few miles of us here, there are farms that melt five, six, seven hundred cows. That's an awful lot of 30 cow dairy farms in one location. Um, they are increasing output thanks to aggressive application of science and technology. The dairy industry is the most aggressive adopter of science and technology that I can think of in agriculture. But it's also characterized by older practitioners, old guys, white hair, you know. Uh, the age is, is advancing. It's heavily leveraged. Agriculture doesn't attract equity money. It attracts, uh, you have to finance it with debt. And so most of these farms are heavily indebted and they pay a lot of money in interest every month. And they are focused on wholesale markets. And those wholesale markets are changing dramatically. It's all about food chains they talk about today. And the competition is not just here in New England or the Northeast or in the United States. If you're milking cows, your competition is in New Zealand, in the European community. And they want our market. And they are going to undercut us if they possibly can. So the dairy industry and bulk commodity agriculture that that represents is in increasingly vulnerable to the pressures of globalization and consolidation. Realize Walmart's the biggest marketer of groceries in the United States. Walmart sets the price. They push it back through the system, and that's the way it is. Then we have this other track in agriculture, and we don't have a good name for it. Some people call it new agriculture. It's not new, it's old agriculture being practiced in a kind of a new way, or niche agriculture, a cutesy term, but it's agriculture where there's a close connection between the producer and the consumer. And so around here it's farm stands, farmers markets, um, uh, pick your own, uh, value added agriculture. People doing stuff that the nearby consumer wants and will pay a premium for. And so it's mostly part time. The people who are in it tend to be uh, quite well educated. Uh, it can be practiced on smaller parcels of land. and. Uh, 
it is um, a situation basically uh, trading on pride and perception as much as on the actual value of the crop that they're producing. So um, I always have to, I don't want to have a lot of time for, for questions, but I just want to tell you about two incredible forces that are moving right now in agriculture, and it's right here under our noses. Um, number one is the coming of robotics. I just read an article about how they're trying to figure out how they're going to, it's, it's on the horizon, harvest trees where the guy's going to sit in a warm trailer and it's all going to be done by robotic machines that cut down the trees. That's coming. That's coming. Uh, right here, right up the river from us, uh, robots are milking cows. Up to this point, they relied about 15 Mexican workers to milk the cows, six, five, 600 cows. Now a robot does it. So we don't have to have the Mexican workers anymore. So we're saving all this money on labor. And then the cow kind of likes getting milk five or six times a day, so she produces more milk. And then all this sophisticated software that runs that equipment produces an incredible trove of information that you as the farmer have at your fingertips to manage the herd. The computers will tell you cow number 877 this morning had one of her quarters produce milk that was about one and a half degrees higher in temperature than the other three quarters. Uh oh, we've got an infection setting in. We can treat that before it becomes a critical issue. All of those things are right there with this robot. Everybody said, how the hell does a robot milk a cow? I'll divert a little bit and I'll tell you how. Each cow has a necklace and she's got a transponder on that necklace that talks to the computer. She feels, hmm, I think I'd like a little treat. And so there's a little treat waiting over in the robot. And she walks over. The computer says, hmm, okay, you can come in. Opens the gate, she walks in, gate closes behind her, she gets her treat. And the robot goes to work. An arm comes over and sprays warm sanitizing spray on her udder. And little motors come out and they brush the udder so it's clean. And then a jet of warm air dries the other, just like in the restroom at the restaurant, you know, you rub the hand, dry. And then the arm comes back out and the teacups come up and they set to work. They're guided by laser beams. Comes up, catches the teat, catches the teat. Oh, miss that one a little bit, backs down, hunts around, comes up, catches. As soon as all four are on, then it begins the pulsation. And that milk flows down into the robotic claw, they call it, and goes to the bulk tank. And when she's done, the robot knows, pulls the teacups off, opens the gate, sends her on her way. Amazing. Just incredible. The technology all comes from Holland. It costs $250,000 for one machine that will do 60, 000, 60 cows but they figure they can save so much on labor. So that's, that's what's happening, robotics in, here and there. I went to a huge uh, greenhouse operation over east of Concord in Loudness, the biggest greenhouse operation north of Boston. It's absolutely vast. And they're using robots to plant the seeds and then transplant the little plugs into bigger containers. And they sell you know, 50,000 of these plants and 30,000 of those plants to Shaw's and uh, Home Depot's and all those places. And it's incredible. So that's happening. And then the other thing that's happening out here is the breaking down the genome. DNA. You can take a little bull calf. Used to be, well, until just recently, we want to get the top genetics in our dairy herd and so we want to get the best genetics from anywhere in the world. And we want to find the bull that's going to improve uh, the, the next generation. He's going to get more milk for us. The cows are going to be bigger, sturdier, stronger, all these attributes. And in order to figure out which bulls are going to do that for us, are going to impart the genetic characteristics that we want in the succeeding generation, it takes about six years to what they call prove a bull. And so this is an elaborate process. And he's got to be, he's got to grow up to puberty, and then he's got to be mated to cows, and the cows have got to have the calves, and we've got to raise the calves to figure out whether the calves are going to do as well or better than their mothers, and so on. It takes about six years to get that done. Today, 
We can take a hair or a drop of blood from a three-day-old baby bull calf and run through the lab and determine if that critter has in his DNA the attributes that we want in his daughters. Three days, we can do that. And that's happening in poultry and pork and beef, all up and down, everywhere. It's continuously improving the genetic potential of livestock. And it's happening in crops. There's huge uh, research farms in Iowa and Indiana uh, run by Monsanto and yeah. Lilly and all these major companies looking for the corn that will resist drought or the soybean that will be immune to some terrible parasite. All of that's happening and it's all based on the genome and the study and the breaking down of the genome. So that's where that's all at. So here we are in the valley. We have a lovely culture of agriculture and support for our local agriculture. And we have a pretty healthy agricultural enterprise. We've got a nice balance. We've got dairy farming, uh, some of the very, very best. And we are very, very favored. From Hoy River Junction to about Deerfield, Mass, this is the best microclimate for raising feed for dairy cow. And I got that from a guy who managed dairy farms in big farms in Indiana, in, uh, in um, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, all over, and he managed a farm here for several years, and he said, there's no area that has the microclimate and the soils and the moisture and the uh, freedom from violent weather and all of these things that all come together to make it so this is the best agricultural uh, environment for feeding dairy cows outside probably of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. So I said that's pretty important to me. And then we have a nice culture of, of entrepreneurship and we got a lot of nice farm stand operations. I'm sure you folks know them. Uh, these people are doing a great job. We go to these farmers markets and all kinds of stuff being done. It, it just wasn't here 15 or 20 years ago and, and that's marvelous. When I started as Commissioner of Agriculture in 1982, we had 12 farmers markets and they consisted of a piece of plywood on two saw horses, you know, and it was pretty grim. And now we got over 80, and Vermont, same. I don't know, Vermont probably has over 100. And so that, that's all great, makes, uh, makes the, uh, the agricultural culture part. And you know, in Europe, agriculture is two words, agri and culture. Agri is the production, culture is the integration of the production into life. It's so, it's just so important, it's, so, it's such a big deal. Well anyway, I talked long enough, hope you didn't all go to sleep. <laughs> uh, so you do it at night, sometimes people are sitting there, God, I wanna go home and watch the Red Sox, oh, well, we'll get down again and all that. Anyway, okay, anybody have a question for me? I'll take a little time and then Marita will call it off, okay? And yes, sir? We have uh, microphones. If you just wait for the microphone to get there. There comes the microphone. Look at that. Well, wait. Wait till the end. You might not. You might change your mind. your mouth, please. You didn't mention anything about powdered milk. Powdered milk? in Europe is in on powdered milk. Ah. Oh, terrible. Or UHT milk. It has a shelf life and it's in pouches and it can sit there for months. The only place where we get that here is in those coffee creamers, that's UHT milk. Powdered milk, it just and lots of people would like love to do it. You know, just dehydrate the milk and then add some water at home and you got milk. It just doesn't taste very good. Gee. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. No, I, I agree. I agree. No it's, good. It's awful. Uh, yeah. I had a question about who built the stone wall. Somebody told me that there were itinerant stone masons who yes. go around. Yeah. Can you elaborate on that? Well, uh, yes. Uh, there, there were immigrants that were brought in for, for masonry and uh, building stone walls. Uh, of course, Scotland and Northern England they have a deep tradition of building wonderful stone walls. And those people were, were naturals. Italians like to do it. Um, a, a, a interesting thing, a well, hundred years later, a lot of Italians came here to build stone culverts and overpasses and things for the railroads. They got away from timbers, you know, that rotted down and they started doing it with masonry. And so you got White River Junction and the whole neighborhood up there called Little Italy. All those people came, 1900, to work on the railroad <coughs> culverts and stuff. Anyway, yeah. I wondered if you could 
talk a little bit about what might be going on legally to protect farmland. I'm thinking of what's going on at uh, Randolph on I-89. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, I've got to say, that in terms of farmland protection, it's, it's always been since the late 70s, really a hot subject in New England. A lot has been done, not in much in Maine, uh, but in Massachusetts, in Vermont, and Connecticut, tremendous uh, uh, emphasis on protecting farmland by buying development rights. Uh, you know, the, just can't take it out of play for development. Uh, but uh, public policy decisions often, uh, like Randolph, that kind of thing, is a real push-pull because farmland is always the most easily developed land that's available and uh, they love to get it and uh, put something on it. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's the political process at work, I guess. I, I don't have a ready answer for how to make it come out the way we all would like. Yes. Yes. I'm wondering, with all the solar farms going up, it seems to me that it's a pity that that land goes out of production. And I'm wondering if anybody's investigating what what that environment might be good for in terms of agriculture. Yeah, yeah, some they are. Plant or something. Yeah. Bees that would be happy. Oh yeah. Those. Yeah. What what can they be used for other than the waste? I guess it's uh, wildlife habitat is about all I can think. I don't know. You, you got any ideas? What yeah. can you do? Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is being addressed. Uh, I've read at least two articles about this. Um, and they can, you know, if you plant your solar panels in a way that you can do things like sheep, chickens, uh, even some gardening mm. underneath them. Mm. And, of course, there is the the fact that all these quote unquote unsightly weeds uh, support a huge amount of very important wildlife like the butterflies and the bees and so mm. on. Mm. So we need to remember all that. So, mm. so yes, people are definitely working on that. Um, and my, my comment while I have the mic is, yeah, we humans are really clever and we get so focused on one little thing like let's have a tomato that has endless shelf life that we forget what's really important. And I hope that in all of this, focusing on the minutia of getting every cow's every mm -hmm. bit of just to produce mm -hmm. more milk, mm -hmm. that we don't forget the larger picture about what's really important in this life. And that is more than just burning down trees mm -hmm. and you know, robotic this and that. That mm -hmm. there is a relationship that we humans have with all these other beings mm -hmm. and the earth that we don't, we don't want to, you know, get it all down to one little point and then they have nothing else to play with. So. Good point. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. No, about all these cows and, and their byproduct, uh, the other byproduct, all that manure, yeah. um, that's causing problems into the rivers. And I wonder yeah. how, yeah. How, that can, how that is being addressed. It, it's got to be addressed by better management strategy. And what the, the problem of Lake Champlain is the legacy of careless application of manure at very, very high rates on soils that are vulnerable to shedding the nutrients into the lake. Um, with good management practices, the, the science we know today, we can ameliorate an awful lot of it. Uh, but it, it just goes back. In, in the 1960s, a lot of manure on dairy farms was taken to the bank of the Connecticut River and dumped because they said it had no value. Well, some research that was done up in Grafton County, I'm proud to say, convinced farmers, you know, you're throwing away money. You're giving the, seed, uh, the fertilizer guy five and six hundred dollars an acre to buy fertilizer and you're throwing away the fertilizer you've already got. So we've had a huge paradigm shift along that line. But there's a long way to go. But cleaning up the legacy of bad practices from the past, it's going to take time and it's going to be difficult. Well, there's a lot of extra manure to, to be harvested and sold is what you're saying. You could use it that way. Yeah, right. Or it can be treated. You know, we can run it through digesters and get energy out of it. And the solids can be recycled and the liquids are then the fertilizer and we can manage it a lot more easily. Uh, it's, it, we, we, we've got a lot of catching up to do, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Good. Okay. 
There's a question here. Oh, yes. Referring back to your comments when the uh, sheep were first brought here mm -hmm. and all the uh, parasites and things mm -hmm. that dealt with them, can you contrast that with later on when they put uh, antibiotics in the feed for everything mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. past that point mm -hmm. where they've started learning that that decreases the the antibiotics effectiveness mm -hmm. and how, so what are they doing now how would that transition um, the, the transition is underway and I would say in five or eight years we will have an enormous shift in in um, uh, I, I will call it protein production with livestock. I'm mean, talking about hogs and chickens and beef, okay? Um, it, it's coming, everybody knows it's coming. Going to have to change a lot of things to adapt and get away from the way we've been doing it in confinement operations. And that's why. Uh, as for dairy, I will want to assure you, every single load of milk that leaves my farm, it cannot be marketed until it has been cleared antibiotic free. In other words, it's tested. You cannot sell anything with antibiotics in dairy. And uh, so we've got that under control. But you've got big hog confinement operations where they got 100,000 animals in one facility, and you get a virus coming in, or you get a pathogen of some sort, and it goes right through. They had this in the last year or so, terrible episodes. Uh, same with poultry and, okay. and other things. Um, that's the good, a good argument for dispersed, smaller scale agriculture and uh, more, I don't want to say humane treatment, scaled down production. Um, there's a lot of opposition to us on that. You know, big meat companies, they want reliable, cheap supplies of live animals to process. They're thinking about the animals. Well, <laughs> okay. Yeah. You got it. Anybody else? I th yes, okay. Last question. Um, just wondering if uh, you could say something about the, just wondering if you might say something about um, the types of crops that were grown in the hill farms, um, the wheat sheep grown, I guess. I, I missed the first of what you said. What was that now? About I was wondering if you might say something about the, the types of crops that, I was wondering if you might say something about the types of crops that were grown in hill farms. Okay. Um, and if I could add a second one, because I don't know if that's going to be much of a response, but um, you didn't say anything about tree crops. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. What about this? All right. Okay, first, first the, the, the hay crops that were grown around here were basically volunteer grasses. Whatever would grow, would grow. Uh, beginning in the post-Civil War era with the coming of scientific research about improved strains, we began to get what's called uh, herds grass, we call it Timothy now, um, and then clovers. And uh, by about 1900, we began to understand that legumes like clover or alfalfa fix nitrogen themselves and can nurture grasses. Uh, those kinds of things came. Uh, but again, it goes back to the malnutrition. The, the, the feed was not very good, that, that's that. Now, the other question you had was? Um, about tree crops. Oh, tree crops. Well, uh, the, the attitude has always been to get out of the way. Mm, the trees will grow. Mm, yeah. don't, don't have to worry about it. They, they no, volunteer. Yeah, oh, okay, all right, all right. Uh, well, I was just going to say, uh, if we don't mow our lawn for the summer, we'll have little baby trees, and in three years we'll need a chainsaw to get the lawn back. Um, uh, tree crops, uh, uh, apples, yes, uh, improved strains of apples. Uh, it's interesting now we're sort of going back to the future. We're all talking about heritage types of apples that are more resistant to common apple diseases, those kinds of things. A lot, a lot of good stuff going on over there, but also a lot of it's being done with study of the genome of the of the apple. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you all very, very much. Enjoy it. Thank you very much. And I'm sure he's willing to answer individual questions if you'd like to go up and talk to him.